The Ben Heck Show is brought to you by Element 14, the electronic design community where you can connect and collaborate with top engineers from around the world. Join now at element14.com. Hello and welcome back to The Ben Heck Show. We're getting back to our mini pinball build. Last time we used MATLAB and Simulink to make a simulation of the pinball game. Now I think it's time to move on to some mechanisms. Yeah, can we, Ben? Can we? Yes, that's right. Yes. So what we're gonna do next, we're gonna do actually a couple things at the same time. I'm going to be working on mechanisms. Uh, we're gonna have something that affects the ball, like a pop bumper, something that reacts to the ball, like a target, and then also I need to make the ball loader launcher mechanism to cycle through the states of the game. Okay, so what's the other thing? Well, the other thing is that Felix is going to be working on a new revision of the PCB. We're going to reorient it so that it basically resembles how we want it to be in the actual game. We're going to add some light drivers and some switch drivers and also work on some code. Let's get started. Amazing hacks. Should we take it for a spin? Inspired designs. Imhotep's priests. Regrettable acting. No one seems to get it. Each week, Element 14's The Ben Heck Show brings you innovative projects using electronics, engineering, and more. Okay, Felix, we need to work on the mini pinball machine in today's episode. Awesome, I'm excited to get back to it. Right, so we have this um, breadboard that you worked up. Mm. So this is cool and all, but I think we should build something that kind of represents how it's actually going to be in the machine. Yeah. So we should probably take the microcontroller and have it off to the side so you can get, get at the uh, USB port easily for programming. Figure out a place to put the screen, redo some of the components. Uh, yeah, my vision is that it goes back here, mm -hmm. right? And so we have the LCD screen near yeah, the top there. of it. Yeah. You want the ports on this side right here? Yeah, probably we'll, we'll be biased. We'll put them on the right side since okay. people are right-handed. Sure. So they can like go boop, to like do the USB. So I would say a screen in the center and then enough PCB to get you to the edge. Does okay. that make sense? Yep. Yeah, and so basically all these same components, uh, you have how many, you have what, six uh, solenoid controls on that? Yes. How about um, just how many? four maybe? Okay, yeah, that'd be good. Because we got flipper, flipper, and then I'm also working on uh, some new mechs. Okay. So I'm thinking maybe you could work on rewiring this board and I can work on some new mechs and then we can just touch base and make sure that the mechs will work with the board and vice versa. Okay, what do you think about um, adding additional headers so that we could potentially swap from the Teensy to an Arduino? Oh, so it could use both? Yeah. Yeah, that's not a bad idea. So have like some headers out here for the Arduino. Yeah. Now the Arduino isn't going to give you the same sound capabilities, but it could still do the logic and drive the LCD at least. Right. And uh, we wanted to have a, this is a five volt system, but we want to have 12 volts going in to control the uh, solenoids. Well, this is probably a 3.3 volt okay. microcontroller yeah. actually. Well, if we yeah, so a... 12 volt wall wart, All right. and then we'll knock it down to five for this and then use the 12 for the um, coils. Right, okay. I think that sounds pretty good. I'm wiring up an example here using the LED driver, the uh, TI part constant current driver. And also I've combined it with the shift registers for the switches. And I'm attaching it to the spy bus of this Arduino so we can try reading and writing in the same operation to save time. And then if it works on the Arduino, it'll certainly work on the Teensy. So yeah, that's basically what I'm doing. I think the Teensy uses four bit mode for its SD card, but it probably has additional spy buses that we can access. Uh, yeah, so I've got the connections hooked up, so I just need to hook up some test switches and LEDs so we can see if this thing works. Okay, I hooked this up to the Arduino and I ran some test code. I've actually only ever used the spy bus on the Arduino before when I was doing the uh, SD card stuff. Uh, yeah, but it's pretty straightforward. There's something called spy transfer value. Now, again, spy bus, you're sending eight bits and then you're also getting eight bits. So in this case, I'm receiving inputs and transferring value. Now value is just uh, one being clocked through the bits up to 15. Uh, so basically it's just gonna rake through like the 16 lights. And then I should also get 16 bits back. However, it looks like it's operating in eight bit mode. If you look at the lights here, see how it's going zero to seven and eight to 15. So it's not actually sending a 16 bit value, it's sending two eight bit values. I've also got these switches coming through on the switch monitor here. And uh, yeah, that looks correct. I have it 
set to um, five uh, highs and one low. So that pattern is correct. So we can definitely do it. I just have to figure out how to get the um, Arduino library to do a 16-bit spy transfer. Then once we do that, we should see this go discreetly doot, doot, instead of you know having two of them go at once. You can also see like the last one is missing. Well, at least on this side. Uh, yeah, so I got to look for the 16-bit data transfer and then uh, that should give us what we need. And then the libraries here in Arduino will be pretty much the same as they are in Teensy because Teensy is based off Arduino. Well, I think I figured out the problem. I just have to type spy transfer 16. <laughs> yeah, okay, so what we're doing here is we're pulsing the latch. And now I, I did actually use two different lines because the light driver is active high or positive rising edge pulse to latch the data. Whereas the switches, it's a falling pulse to latch the data. So I actually separated that into two separate uh, pulses right here. So we go from high to low with the LEDs, and then we go from low to high with the switch latch. So we do that. And then I did uh, the spy begin transaction. I don't know if I actually need that. Let's try it without. But then we just do inputs, which is what we want to get, and then spy transfer 16 value, which is what we want to send. So we're basically, you know, getting the switches at the same time that we uh, send the lights. Super efficient. Okay, so the lights are working. So we're going from zero to 15. Let's see what's going on with the switch input bus. Okay, for some reason it's returning a 32-bit value. See how it's got eight hex characters there? That's a bit weird. I wonder why it's doing that. We have inputs. I called it a sh oh, pfft. unsigned short. Ah, that's weird that, I wonder if that, will that make a difference? It did, weird. So signed or unsigned numbers means, can it go negative? So if you have a, um, a short, which is a 16-bit number, it would be able to go from zero to 65535. However, if it's a signed short, that means its range is negative 32,768 to positive 32,767, around that range. So what's strange about that is, yeah, I don't know why that would make a difference of what we got back. I don't know why. Oh, you know what it probably was? If it's a negative number, it probably rolled over and then created a value which became a 32-bit value. Yeah. <laughs> so anyway, but by specifying that these are unsigned, positive-only numbers, we know exactly what range they're in. I mean, we could probably make it work with ints as well, but I prefer to use the exact data size that we're going to uh, actually send. All right, so there we go. We got the uh, switches and the lights working on the same spy bus. I printed this up. It's a test target. So it has a frame which holds a little switch. Frame can be printed like that. It's using a toothpick for the pivot point. And I have a, uh, a slope here, which is uh, 76 degrees, which is the same slope as the switch in the open position. So when you hit it, see how it rests against the switch like that? So that gives it like a stopping point. So that's how it would fit on the play field. Okay, that looks like my switch came loose. That's because I was trying to break it. Honestly, my fingers probably have more force than this ball will. Um, I probably need a front stop because otherwise you can go like, that's kind of lame. I can't do that with a piece of wood. I'll have to do it with a piece of plastic. So I'll have to modify this frame design with a little stop here so this switch can't go too far back. It can only go forward like that. Because if I try to do it with wood, I won't be able to actually pull this part out. So yeah, you can't just think about how the mechanism works. You also have to think about how it's assembled. Because if you make something that cannot be assembled, what's the point? All right, I got the new target printed out. Sorry, old target, you are garbage. Well, not really garbage. We have a bucket of 3D printed parts and we take it to shows and stuff and we give the parts away to kids and they're like, oh, cool, free 3D printed parts. But little do they know it's actually just garbage. Yeah, that works pretty well. Look at that. Click, 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 click. Cool. So you can figure out how much current something's gonna draw by checking its resistance. This is 11.93 ohms, so maybe call it 12 ohms. So actually, that makes it really simple. 12 ohms, and then you divide it by the voltage, which is gonna be 12 volts, that gives us one amp. So even without putting on the power supply, we can predict how much uh, current this is gonna draw. So when we were looking for the power supply, we're like, okay, there, well, there's like two flippers. So, you know, one amp, one amp, two amps and then you know, throw in another amp for overhead. 
Also, I mean, if we have another one of these as a pop bumper, that could be up to three amps. Now that's gonna be very short bursts, but there still is a potential that it could be drawing that much current at one time. Uh, so I have this piece of plywood here to represent the play field because we can't just, you know, look at the distance with it uh, open frame like this. We have to think about the play field being in the way. See if it's too far away, the magnetic field cannot capture it. You need to be a little closer for it to be captured. So yeah, so it might look okay at that height, but it's actually too high. So I need to, it needs to start a little bit lower for it to be capturable. Is that a word, capturable? Hey Karen, could you give me a hand with the measurement? So I don't have enough hands to do that. I want you to measure the height of the post off oh. the wood. So we need to figure out what distance is correct. Measure that. All right, let's try it with the caliper in place. Okay, 0.9 is a nice even number. Okay, we can go with that. I did a bunch of drawings and tried to figure out the best way to make a pop bumper through six millimeters of plywood. I drew the base solenoid there. Then I drew the rod. And the position of this rod with the wood is the um, throw distance that we uh, tested before. If we inspect the surfaces, we can get a distance here. It's about 0.8 inches. So I drew a representation of the spring and the spring rests up against the hole in the rod. I also drew a reference of the rod in its down position just to check. Now here's the important part. This is the bracket. Now the bracket sits just above the solenoid here and just below the play field. Now the reason it has to fit below the play field is when the thing is going spring, 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 it's going to pull against the bottom of the bracket, which means it has to be on the other side of the wood. If we just tried to press fit it in place, it would just pop out. So our rod fits in there. And then we needed an actuator to actually uh, move the ball around. So I drew this as a temp. Uh, it probably needs to be a little bit bigger, but it has a hole in the front where we can stick a rod through to hold the other rod to make it uh, stay put. Then there's gonna be a little cap on top, just uh, you know, just, just for testing purposes. This will be a little bigger. It'll probably actually have some uh, latching tabs in it when we actually draw it for real, but this is enough to test. Yeah, so we have a uh, 45 degree angle on this. So if this comes down on the ball, it should shoot it out sideways. Uh, now there's not a whole lot of throw to this. I think we'll get about uh, 0.4 to 6 inches of movement. So it'll be about like, not quite half an inch, like bam, bam, like that. Uh, what I think we can do to make up for that is if we make this disc extend out a little bit further in this direction, that will give it a, uh, basically give a wider angle to hit the ball. We still need a way to trigger this. Uh, like how do we know the ball's actually there? That's another <laughs> issue we have to solve. But let's get the um, bam, bam, spring action working first. Then we'll figure out the rest later. Okay, I got my 3D printed parts printed. Let's see how they work. So let's put this one into the ring thing here. And I'll use this very scientific toothpick to hold it in place. That will stay in place until the pyramids are dust. Now the spring goes underneath that, and that goes in here, and this cap keeps it from popping off. Uh, I don't have a piece of plywood at the moment, but that's not a big deal. Although, you know, to be thorough, maybe I should put a piece of plywood around this and then I can set a ball next to it and see how much this actually affects the ball. All right, let's try it again. Oh yeah, much better. And that's at 12 volts, sweet. Pow, pow. Nice. Okay, so mechanically it works. Now the real question is, how do we trigger it? <laughs> yeah, I mean, this, this is all pretty solid. I mean, I think I can simplify this part. I mean, it's oh, actually, actually not that many pieces. It's a frame, a cap, and an actuator disc. So if I can get that to print in one piece, then it's still just cap, actuator, frame. Oh, well, there will need to be a mount. For, see, I just have this glued in place. So we'll have another mount, probably made, made of metal on the, on the uh, solenoid, which will go like here, right? Okay, here's a pop bumper from a full-size pinball machine. And there's a disc here, and when the ball touches it, it moves this spoon, and see, any direction will actually trigger it. And the spoon closes this switch, and then it's like bam, bam, bam. But as you can see, the solenoid is below everything in one of these. But this, there's a lot of pieces to this, and this is actually a, a simpler pop bumper, the Williams style, or even more complicated. I think that it's nice about these. Some people don't like them because they're just one piece of plastic, but you just buy this and everything is already lined up. Like you don't have to align the spoon to the tilt bob here. It's, it's pretty easy. So we've kind of built an inverted pop bumper, really. I mean, I, I, like, I like the simplicity of this. The question is, how do we detect?
You can buy metal shims, but those take time to order and arrive. So I cut this mangled looking thing that we can mm. use for testing purposes. So cool. it should fit around here. Haha, -ha, it does. Nice. And I am reprinting portion of this actuator thing so we can inlay one of these brass rods and make it into a ring cool to make both halves of our design so that's just like you know what we can do with hardware store parts while we wait for other things and you said we need the ring around the top and then the disc around the bottom because you need two to points complete to complete a circuit yeah. that makes sense All right, let's test these contact discs with a multimeter. Okay, it's beeping. That's good. I turned off the beep continuity because beep continuity requires a very low resistance. So I'm gonna just look for any conductivity. I think that's actually working better than it appears through the beeps. If we hook this up to like an Arduino or something, we should get a pretty good response. We could also test it on the oscilloscope, but that's probably overkill. Felix, looks like you've made a lot of progress on this board. Perfect. Serial input switches and the light driver both in place. Yeah. Wiring looks nice and neat. Yeah, I uh, put a lot of effort in making it not shabby. That's good. And you say you have the uh, MOSFETs hooked up to the analog lines? Yep, analog five, four, three, two, one. Okay. Actually, and do you have a uh, yeah, flyback diode on this? Yep, it goes okay. five, four, three, two, one. This All is right. So what we could do in the code is we could basically look to see if one of these bits changes on the switch line, and then we could use that to trigger the solenoid, and we could use that to test our pop bumper. Yep. Cool. I've added a few functions. We have coil. So you say which coil, zero to three, and how long in milliseconds. And it writes that value to activate the coil on the IO, and then it sets a timer. Then during the main loop, I mean, this could be an interrupt, but for now I'm just having the main loop. Every cycle, oh, this would actually be four. Uh, we look at the timers to see if it's active. If the timer is active, we decrement it by one. If it reaches zero, we turn off the solenoid. And right here I have switch check zero, Basically, if switch check it returns, you know, that the switch is closed and the timer is not already active, then print switch hit and activate the coil for 100 milliseconds. So we can test it by just, uh, first of all, just using this wire here. See if it goes. Let's plug in our uh, ring test and uh, see what happens. It should repel it away and open the switch. Wow, look at all the points we're getting. Well, that's all the time we have for today, but we made some pretty good progress on the PCBs and the mechanisms. Sounds good. If you have any comments or questions about the mini pinball build, remember to post those on the Element 14 community on element14.com forward slash TBHS. You can also go there to read about other upcoming episodes, builds, and special events. We'll see you next time. What if you had a girlfriend named Alexa? I wonder if that has happened. If I cared about your life, I would do that. But I'm only who I am. Yes, be who you are. Be who you are. You are so fortunate to be who you are. Luckily, I am a supervillain named Bane. Ha! I bet you wish you were me. But you're not. You're only who you are. Yes. Just be who you are, because that's who you get to be. I am Bane. That's when him and the unit guy escape to uh, wherever, east, and hook up with the, uh, the Queen of Dragons. I need to find my ball. I think Lisa took it. A whole new, a whole new squirrel. Unbelievable nuts. Indescribable chirping. Yes, that's right. We made up a song called A Whole New Squirrel. <laughs> Let's see what I can do to ball. I need to fix the spacer. Huh? In our previous episode, we were working on the mini pinball machine. 
Also, Felix began wiring another revision of the prototype motherboard. Here's where we're at so far. I need to connect the wire in a better way. I'm just gonna put a little hot glue on it. Here I've uh, got a program on the Arduino that is running a Hello World example. Anyway, this goes right there. Bam, nailed it. <laughs> ah. 